Welcome to the Global Hemophilia Report, a podcast led by science, curiosity, and storytelling. Produced by Believe Limited and Bloodstream Media in partnership with senior advisor Dr. Donna D. McKelly and made possible thanks to our featured advertiser, Sanofi. I am your host and resident person with hemophilia, Patrick James Lynch. Today's topic, the evolving landscape of novel therapies for hemophilia, what's here and what's coming. We discuss EMI, EFA, and all sorts of other acronyms and nicknames right after this. Life with hemophilia shouldn't be defined by limits, and the right education along the way can be a game changer. Sanofi is here to provide education and resources to help you manage treatment, care, and lifestyle on your terms, so you can focus on what matters most. The planopy of novel therapeutics on the hemophilia treatment landscape was highlighted in one of the earliest episodes of the inaugural season of the Global Hemophilia Report. And frankly, it has continued to influence many of the Global Hemophilia Report discussions since. Now in the podcast's third season of exploring research-related outcomes and persistent gaps, we thought it would be timely to revisit the evolving novel therapeutic landscape and to ask some important questions, such as, what have been the drug development successes over the past few years for both hemophilia A and B? What more have we learned from our post-licensure experience with the agents that have already been marketed? What outstanding questions remain, and what are the exciting products in the preclinical and early trial pipelines? This discussion is timely and important. Now, we recently explored similar questions related to the clinical implementation of hemophilia A and B gene therapy and future research. That is the subject of Global Hemophilia Report, episode 25. If you'd like to go back and listen, I strongly recommend that you do. But for this episode, the focus will be on the newest additions to the menu of extended half-life factor replacement, as well as the newest developments in factor mimetic therapies and hemostatic rebalancing agents. As always, we'll kick things off with a round of introductions from our panelists. I'm Amy Shapiro. I'm a pediatric hematologist. I'm medical director and CEO of what's now called Innovative Hematology and the in Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center in Indianapolis. Pleasure to be here with you today. So, Maria Elisa Mancuso, I'm an hematologist taking care of patients with inherited uh, acquired bleeding disorder of any age, so from childhood to adulthood, in, uh, at Humanitas Research Hospital in Milan, Italy. I'm Steve Pipe, pediatric hematology at the University of Michigan. I've um, been directing the pediatric hemophilia program here for a few decades now, but really excited about our discussion coming up to, for today. And it's an absolute pleasure to see all of you and to join you in this very exciting discussion. Uh, I'm Johnny Mashangu. I am a hematologist based in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I look after patients with bleeding disorders, and uh, I'm part of the University of the Witwatersrand Strand in Johannesburg. So hello everybody, I'm Lynn Malik. I'm an adult and pediatric hematologist and I serve as the medical director of our hemophilia treatment center at uh, Varsity in Milwaukee, Wisconsin um, and do patient related care as well as um, research through the Blood Research Institute. Lynn, Johnny, Steve, Maria, Alicia and Amy, thank you for participating. You will also hear the voice of senior advisor Dr. Donna D. McKelly from her interviews with our panel. Now let's get started. There's no denying the fact that the introduction of the first factor VIII mimetic therapy, emicizumab, was a major breakthrough in the management of hemophilia A, particularly severe patients with inhibitors. Now that the therapy has been out in the real world for a number of years, what have we learned about emicizumab? and how is it comparing to other therapies? Maria Alicia kicks off our conversation describing the post-licensure experience of emicizumab. We were already uh, pretty much sure that this was uh, the revolution for inhibitor patients because it was for the first time we had the opportunity to offer 
this group of patients affective prophylaxis, which was really the biggest gap in hemophilia care. And all the data tells us really in a very robust way that those patients are the one who has the largest benefit from emicizumab use. From the non-inhibitor group, I would say that we learned that space should be given to treatment individualization. What I mean is that emicizumab is good for many of them, but not for all. And this tells us that the level of protection and the variables that we have to take into account to uh, offer a good protection to each individual is different. So in my personal experience, but also if you go through the real world experience in the literature, you can, say, you can see that some patients needed to go back to replacement, which is not a step backward. It's just um, appreciating the fact that, that some patients do, on the long term, they are not very well protected with the level of protection provided by such a type of non-replacement therapy. Of course, we have to acknowledge that the mechanism of action of this molecule is different from replacement therapy. And in certain situations, this is also real life. We know that some patients, maybe in some period of their life, they do better with replacement and others the other way around. So this is, to me, the main take-home message of the real-world experience of Amy. Mm -hmm. For us, it was really the observation in the inhibitor patients first and seeing what transformative power this therapy had in these patients' lives. But understanding the mechanism of action, it's irrelevant whether a patient has an inhibitor or not for how this works. You're starting from a much more challenged base in the patients with inhibitors, but we felt like there was no reason why we wouldn't achieve these types of outcomes with our non-inhibitor patients. And so we very quickly adopted this as our primary therapeutic prophylaxis approach for our non-inhibitor patients. And definitely room for individualization, as Elisa said, but this has become the great dominant prophylactic approach in our clinic across the age groups. And uh, as we get into it, we can talk about how this has also influenced our approach with our babies. We certainly do want to talk about emicizumab's use in babies, but not quite yet. I was just going to add two points um, to, to Elise's very excellent summary. The one um, area that perhaps uh, the real world data is still evolving is the question of dosing. We are aware that uh, obviously in addition to us prescribing the licensed dosing, there is uh, a need and certainly an expectation that we will explore other dosing regimens associated uh, with the use of and in our part of the world, we are particularly interested in whether this uh, medication can be used uh, in lower doses than what currently is required. And, and we're seeing data evolving in that space, but we don't have quite widespread data. Uh, and, and to me, that is uh, one area that perhaps needs to be settled. Uh, and then the other area, uh, and I think all of us who are here did experience this, that I think somewhere in 2017, uh, there was quite an alarming uh, rate at which uh, uh, the prophets of doom thought that this was the end of this molecule when we saw uh, microangiopathy and thrombosis. Uh, the real world data, in fact, has proven the opposite, in fact, that this drug, with the mitigating measures that were put in place at the time, it's actually relatively safe. And, and I'm saying relatively safe. Of course, it depends on uh, which patient population you are using the drug in. And of course, what dosage regimen are you adopting? I could add something to that. In addition to Johnny's very important comment about using lower doses in resource constrained settings. And that's been done in Thailand as well and showing efficacy of this agent. I think in our clinic, what we're concerned about is drug wastage. We don't like wasting medication just because the package insert says so many milligrams per kilogram. And it's, you know, a monoclonal bispecific antibody you can double the dose even when you're giving it weekly for some patients to try to get more efficacy. Giving the entire vial would be something that would be nice to explore rather than wasting medication. Yes, I think 
probably to maybe um, emphasize what a few people have said, because um, I in our clinic, we have a lifespan clinic, so we treat you know, itty bitty babies until patients as old as they come. Um, and I do think there has been certainly, and I know that Steve will touch on this later, uh, a, a seismic change in terms of what our conversations are with really young children. So babies and their parents, especially if they are, hemophilia is a new diagnosis for their family and the concept of IV therapy is not something that they have contemplated. I think in that space, emicizumab has been certainly a game changer and a conversation changer. And then I also think that as we as clinicians have had more familiarity with the drug, as Johnny states, as some of that maybe safety concerns initially, we've been able to better understand those. And we've been able to also think about this therapy for other pockets of patients that we didn't necessarily have on the clinical trials. And I know I have still, unfortunately, a fair number of my adult patients who may be skeptical about prophylaxis in general. They have difficulty with accessing their veins. And so I think some of the ease of administration has really been helpful. And to be able to, through shared decision-making, have patients buy into three or six months of therapy to just see how they feel. And I think without any exceptions, patients have felt better. And so that has really offered, I think, an option for what I think will be the right thing to do long term for patients that maybe hadn't been able to be on reliable prophylaxis for a slew of different reasons. So what about those babies? What do we know about emicizumab's prophylactic use in little ones? The last group across the lifespan to really be studied in the Haven clinical trials exploring emicizumab was babies, infants. The Haven 7A Phase 3B multi-center open-label single-arm study was established to evaluate emicizumab's efficacy, safety, and other characteristics in patients from birth to 12 months of age. And when Steve Pipe learned about the trial he jumped at the chance to enroll his center. It never really made sense to me for years and years why we weren't aiming for prophylaxis as early in life as possible. He elaborates right after this quick break. The hemophilia community shares a connection that spans generations. This World Hemophilia Day, Santa Fe is bringing together generations young and old to celebrate the past, present, and the future of this global community. It's a day to recognize where this community has been and discover new ways to keep growing alongside one another. Santa Fe is committed to helping redefine what's possible for those with hemophilia. Visit redefininghemophilia.com to browse resources and find an event near you. Welcome back. Steve Pipe on why he enrolled his center and his infant patients into Haven 7. So our interest in this trial stemmed from something that we'd already changed our practice clinically, even before the Haven 7. It never really made sense to me for years and years why we weren't aiming for prophylaxis as early in life as possible. It was always an anxiety promoting exercise to have to talk to a family for the next nine to 12 months or so. We're just going to have to react to bleeding events and be careful because practically speaking, we just don't have a therapeutic that you can do easily uh, in the home setting. And we only ever did prophylaxis for patients who had catastrophic bleeding events, including intracranial hemorrhages. And so with the observed efficacy of emicizumab and understanding how it's administered, um, it just made sense that this should be, this could be, and maybe should be introduced as early in life as possible to help us fill this gap where we weren't able to do effective prophylaxis. So we weren't necessarily envisioning that these patients would only ever exclusively be on emicizumab lifelong, but at least the goal here was let's get them covered with prophylaxis Let's hope we never see an intracranial hemorrhage in an infant ever again. And then let's observe what the impact is for managing these patients. And is there a chance that we're actually improving joint outcomes over the long term? So we were already doing that in practice. Haven 7 trial became available. available. We jumped right into it. Were you at all hesitant about enrolling babies in this clinical trial for emicizumab? When people have questioned our approach, which we've now been doing for um, more than six years, one of the things that I've often heard is, why are you doing this, Steve? Babies don't bleed. 
You know, they're not mobile yet. You, they don't need to have prophylaxis. And one of the important pieces of data is the entry data that these babies came into the trial. So what you have, I don't want people to miss is that half of the infants were minimally treated and half were pups. Pups meaning previously untreated patients, no previous factor eight exposures. And if we look at those who had any factor eight exposures, two thirds of all the babies before entry into the trial had already experienced the bleed. And these were fairly evenly divided between spontaneous bleeds, about a third of them, about a quarter were traumatic, and then many of them were actually procedural or surgical. And this is an important key. You can say, oh, your, your baby's not going to bleed as long as nothing happens, but you can't anticipate when procedures or surgeries are needed, and you certainly can't anticipate trauma. I want to add to what Steve said about the comment that babies don't bleed. We do know that babies do bleed, but not only that, there's tremendous anxiety for the family to prevent bleeds, worrying about what their child does, what do they bump into when they're learning to walk, when they're crawling, when getting a babysitter, going out at night, giving them that peace of mind that your child is covered is, I think, as critical as preventing bleeds for family function. So emicizumab, in my mind, transformed the approach to these infants. And then if we look at the results from after they were initiated on emicizumab, these are really very good efficacy endpoints. What's the number one sort of hallmark of severe hemophilia bleeding? It's uh, spontaneous bleeds that need to be treated. And it was zero. We didn't have a single treated spontaneous bleed for the entirety of the, the follow-up period. And then if we look at treated joint bleeds, um, it comes out to an ABR of, of essentially a zero. So to my assessment of the data, this achieved exactly what we are hoping for from this prophylactic intervention. We have not had any intracranial hemorrhages in the data so far. So now where people are focused on is, okay, Steve, you made this decision to do this in your population of patients. What happens as they accumulate factor eight exposures at sporadic periods of time over the course of their life? And are you either increasing the risk for inhibitors? How are you going to know whether you're going to be able to rely on factor eight down the line? You haven't tolerized them to factor eight. And I wouldn't say I have the answer for that question, but what I can tell you is we haven't had a single inhibitor in our patient population. And of the 50 infants in the study so far, there's only been uh, two that have had development of inhibitors, and they were uh, triggered by uh, multiple exposures to factor eight over a fairly uh, close period of time. Really? Actually, it's got two out of it's two out of 25, right? Because only 25 actually had exposures to factor eight. That at least that's the way the paper relates it. Yeah. So so if you, so half of the babies have haven't needed any factor eight treatment. So you're right. So we're looking at the portion who actually did receive uh, factor for any reason. Are we just kicking the can down the road with, related to inhibitors? I don't know the answer to that, but I have some rationale to believe that we really have altered the natural history of inhibitor formation in infants. And this could be another game changer of this intervention, in, at least in severe hemophilia A. Let me just clarify what you said. Do you think that you're actually changing the epidemiology of inhibitors rather than deferring the development? Uh, let me offer a historical perspective. Prior to the big push of prophylaxis with the availability of high purity factor and particularly recombinant uh, therapy, the incidence of inhibitors in severe hemophilia was not 40%. The incidence of in hemophilia, the uh, severe hemophilia that we've come to see in prospective clinical trials in the prophylactic era is absolutely related to the intensity that, of which they receive factor in initiation of prophylaxis. So we are if you like, unmasking predilection for inhibitors, but it's the process of pushing factor into this immunologically naive child that elicits the immune response. So there's no question that if you alter the timing of that or the intensity of that, that the epidemiology already has changed 
because it certainly won't occur within the time frame that we're used to be seeing inhibitors. But the other thing that has never been tested in the prophylactic era is we've never had this kind of episodic exposure to factor eight over long periods of time, because if the only time you had that sort of on-demand episodic use were patients who weren't on prophylaxis. So of course they're bleeding and they're getting a treatments on a regular fashion. You now have effective prophylaxis exposures are generally related to uh, procedural or uh, trauma still, but um, spread out over a much longer period of time. If you think about inhibitor development, there's a maturation aspect of inhibitor development. And as you start to develop inhibitor and then you're getting continued exposure to that factor, it's going to alter how the immune response is manifest. If you then have huge gaps of time, months and months, if not years, between your factor exposures. I cannot help but believe that the epidemiology of how those uh, inhibitors manifest is going to be changed. We've got a seven-year study planned, and I think we'll start to answer the questions over the course of the, the long-term outcome of the study. And it'll certainly be very interesting. Yes, I just wanted to add a slightly different per perspective. I agree of, on everything. I do value the fact that the EVAN7 has been in initiated and also with the long-term follow-up. But I think that also looking at those data, we have to always keep in mind that this population is a little bit skewed if we consider the epidemiology and the diagnosis of hemophilia worldwide. Because if we should give a global report, we should take into account that the possibility to offer emicizumab upfront, let's say since birth or since very young age, goes in parallel with the ability to make a diagnosis. And sometimes diagnosis comes not really within the first year of age, but just after the first year of age. Yeah. Yeah. But really to achieve the goal that Steve was mentioning, we should work on diagnosis and to provide as early as possible the diagnosis or the possibility to have the benefit of such drug. So just to follow up on what you just said, when we have patients that we don't know that we're not prepared, that the infant could be affected and it's a spontaneous case and they present with bleeding, what we have done with those families is we have a rapid loading protocol for emicizumab that gets them started at the time that we're starting to treat the bleed to then provide more continuous prophylaxis and ease of treatment going forward. I completely agree with what uh, Elise is saying. And, and in fact, um, I would want to put the uh, challenge of diagnosis perhaps uh, into a different port from the availability of EMI, which is a therapeutic approach. Having said that, in fact, there is a bit of an overlap. Uh, what I see in our environment and certainly in our continent is that once a diagnosis is made, the access to EMI in pediatric patient, as obviously shown by Haven 7, is much, much better compared to the access to hemophilia treatment in the past. Uh, authorities and, and, and funders and everyone looks at that very positively. Uh, to me, that is probably a very positive sign, notwithstanding the fact that the diagnosis might actually be uh, the limiting factor here. So, continued study and real-world experience generally suggests very favorable things for the use of emicizumab, though it also highlights, yet again, how critical a diagnosis is in order for a patient to have a chance at such benefit. Changing gears now, the most recent advancement to recombinant factor VIII therapy has been the introduction of a more extended half-life factor VIII therapy than the previously available extended half-life factor VIII therapy. The lead author cited in a July article from the New England Journal of Medicine about its prophylactic use in children, Dr. Lynn Malik, has extensively studied this product. And the name is tricky, so it's FNS Octacog Alpha. FNS Octacog Alpha, FNS Octacog Alpha, FNS Octacog Alpha. Okay, I'm starting to get it. So really to set the frame around this therapy, I think back to what my patients were often telling me in clinic when I had 
um, you know, extended half-life products in the hemophilia A space really over the last 10 years. I had a lot of, especially the adult patients that if they're on three times a week therapy, they felt, is that really that different? What our new therapy option is. So EFA, we'll call it EFA for short. This really pairs what we know about factor eight biology and the necessity of von Willebrand factor really as a chaperone um, to prevent degradation. Really what we've capitalized is our knowledge of that so that we have the D prime D3 region of von Willebrand factor attached to our factory product so that we are able to do once weekly standardized dosing across all age ranges. That's also a difference compared to some of the extended half-life products where we use different doses for kids versus adults, but everybody got 50 units per kilo once a week. The adolescent and adult study really focused as a primary outcome on the average or mean ABR. And then what I like to also focus on for the study are the things that they did as their key secondary endpoints. One of the important things, which we actually didn't have much of before, is a intrapatient comparison. So where they looked at patients that were already on Profi and then their current prescribed factor eight drug and studied in the scrutinizing way that you do from a clinical trial standpoint. So really logging all of your doses, logging all of your bleeds. And then when they compared those patients while on EFA, they used that as one of their key secondary endpoints, as well as looking at physical health, pain intensity. And then I think importantly for me, when I tease out what resonates most for me as a clinician and as I talk to patients is focusing on our hemophilia joint health scores as part of a standardized aspect of the study. And interestingly, what I think some of the key important parts of the story there are that we saw some of the same median ABR as we are with other products, which was zero, but then diving deeper into you know, what's the nuance of how patients actually did. I think focusing on the intrapatient comparison. So again, this would be the idea of me as a participant in the study, I was on the same drug that my you know, doctor and I had decided on, and then I used study drug that really in that setting, there was evidence of superiority of FNS octacog alpha. And then I think when you, from a bleed standpoint, and then I think when you dive a little deeper into the things that maybe clinicians, do we focus too much on just what are the bleed reports, but how do joints look objectively? What are pains, pain ratings? That's where I think also that data has been very helpful. Notably, her work on FNS octacog alpha gave Lynn reason to reconsider what she thought she knew about joint health and degradation. When I trained as a fellow, I think the way that I learned joint pathology was once joints are damaged, they're damaged, and there's no looking back. So that marker of a hemophilia joint health score, what's range of motion, what's swelling, what does a patient's gait look like in an objective way. The interesting thing with the EXTEND study is they actually saw improvements in the hemophilia joint health scores. I had to take a step back and think, man, that kind of challenges even what I learned about joint health and can joints get better? And I think that has been really important for me to learn more about, dive into from the trial, and then think about that with my patients. Because I think with the biology of the way that the product is composed, what we have is just much different and better factor eight levels across the span of a week. And so I think people may be aware the on the adult study, it's a level of 40% or better for about four days, and then levels that end in the 10 to 15%. That's way different of a kind of look of a factor eight over the course of a week than we had with any of our other therapies. And I think that has actually put patients in a position to that chronic inflammation or synovitis piece that might be that nagging piece that they're wondering, I'm wondering, is that just arthritis or is this anything that could get better in time? As a patient, that question of, is this pain? Is this experience just arthritis? Or is this something I could potentially heal from and do something about is frequently on my mind when it comes to joint pain and discomfort, and I don't think I'm alone. What we have seen and what is supported by the clinical trial is there can be healing in that setting, which again is different than the way that I was trained is like once joint damage is done, it's done. And I think that's been important for us as a team at our center to really think about that. And I think when I'm doing patient-centered counseling, I think about that as well. I think the pivotal trial suggests that joints could get better or some of that pain if it is 
inflammation related may get better with you on this medicine so why don't we try it for three to six months and see how you feel and so i think that those have been some of the salient points besides just median abr of zero which we actually have with many different therapies now what are the aspects that may directly or indirectly imply superiority that we can do better with the therapy that you're on again from my patient perspective i agree with lynn Data on these salient points, and not just on annual bleed rate, is crucial for determining which option is optimal or superior for my use. And then certainly for our younger patients, I think having a therapy that's IV that also could last the whole week is a potential game changer. All of those were exciting pieces of what I saw come out of the the adult data. And then focusing a little bit more on the Extend Kids data, because that was a study that I was very intimately involved with. We had opened here at our center. As she mentioned at the top, Lynn works for the Comprehensive Center for Bleeding Disorders at Versity Blood Center of Wisconsin, a treatment center that participated in the EXTENDS trial evaluating FNS octocog alpha's prophylactic use in pediatric patients. That looked at our kids that were 12 and under. And as a matter of history, probably more than anything, our primary endpoint in the study was inhibitor formation. I think that's a legacy primary endpoint in pediatrics. But then we also looked at the aspects of bleed rates, treated bleeds, spontaneous bleeds. And what we found in this study, thankfully, was that our previously treated patients, and it's important to note that as we focus on Haven 7 and inhibitor formation, these were previously treated patients. So the older children all had 150 exposure days, the younger kids at least 50 exposure days, that we didn't see inhibitors. Now, I think a lot of us weren't surprised that we didn't see inhibitors. But then what we also saw was that there was really excellent bleed protection as well. Uh, so there was 64% of kids that had no treated bleeds. And I think some of what we've talked, I've had talks with Amy um, and others is what is our new standard of thinking about what do we anchor on? Treated bleeds, especially I like to tell our research team, you know, and as a mom, the life of a kid is like a adverse event, right? You run into something, you drop something on your foot. You know, there's things that happen just because you're a kid being a kid. Um, And so that we obviously have to study that in a scrutinizing way in a clinical trial, but kids without hemophilia have bleeding events from just, you know, daily lives of being a kid. But I think that piece of having the majority of patients having no treated bleeds, again, patients not having inhibitors or any other new safety signals, to me was all very encouraging data to to come out of the study. So, With an extended half-life factor VIII product like FNS octocog alpha, and with a mimetic subcutaneous product like emicizumab, both of which now have at least some amount of real-world data, some amount of encouraging data about their prophylactic use in children, how do patients and providers make decisions about treating with factor versus treating with a mimetic? We have a lot of patients on both. It's not one or the other. Amy and our other panelists respond right after this quick break. The hemophilia community shares a connection that spans generations. This World Hemophilia Day, Sanofi is bringing together generations young and old to celebrate the past, present, and the future of this global community. It's a day to recognize where this community has been and discover new ways to keep growing alongside one another. Sanofi is committed to helping redefine what's possible for those with hemophilia. Visit redefininghemophilia.com to browse resources and find an event near you. We have a lot of patients on both. It's not one or the other. For example, we have patients on emicizumab who participate in significant physical activity and they need a peak, not just a continuous level. They may get a dose of EFA for that activity that could last for quite a period of time during sporting season or sporting events. We have patients who undergo procedures as an outpatient or who have bleeds and the use of EFA on top of emicizumab is very reassuring to both the patient and the provider because Half these things happen on the weekend. The weekend isn't half the week, but it always seems to be the the time when things happen. And if you get a patient who has a bleed on a Friday night, I don't always have to worry on Saturday 
Where are you? What are you doing? Yes, I'll check in with you. How are you feeling? Do you need more? But it's not the same thing of, okay, I've got 12 or 18 hours before I have to treat you again. And how is that going to get accomplished? And for some of these patients, for example, some of our moderate or mild patients who have bleeding events, they're not so facile at home infusion. And this is really helpful to get one dose in them and to have some sense of safety or to do a dental procedure and know that you're covered for a period of time. So it's not necessarily one or the other. Now, for example, we do have some patients who emicizumab, we have a, a basketball player who is being recruited for a real basketball team. And he gets, he basketball is a contact sport in this state. And he really needs that peak and that coverage. And even doubling his dose of Emmy did not provide that for him. For those kinds of patients switching or for those kinds of patients who just don't respond as well or may have experiencing some unusual effects of ME. I had one patient who told me that they got migraines. It happens and it was seemed to be related to the ME. I never heard it from another patient. I have another patient who told me that his joints ached more on ME than they did on Factor 8 products. So it's individualized, as Steve and Lynn have talked about and Elisa has talked about. But it also sounds like a little bit of trial and error is needed to get to that individualized decision, which begs the question, what data is missing that would help inform these treatment decisions? And to Lynn's point about long-term joint health and factor eight, are we confident that we are looking in all the right places for the data that should be considered? We know, and I think we all agree that ABR is not enough. We are at a stage where counting bleeds is not what we want. And maybe also, I think I learned from patients that accepting the compromise of few bleeds if the quality of life is very good because they are doing what they want, it's an exchange and something that they like. So sometimes counting the one bleed doesn't necessarily mean that we are doing bad with the therapy. If you ask me what I want to explore more, it's for sure the role of synovitis in hemophilia as a hard end point. Nowadays, we have an easy way to assess synovitis, which is ultrasound. We can do it regularly. We should add a regular assessment of joint because I would like to know, for, for instance, how long a synovitis stay, stay there. We don't know nothing about the natural history of synovitis. Let's say what we call microbleeds. Maybe we will have the opportunity to know if exposing patient to a drug as emicizumab, very stable steady state, but a certain stage is maybe can not be enough for a joint needing a more intensive protection to cool down a synovitis or an acute uh, uh, inflammation. So I do think with, with these uh, therapeutic weapons, which are really extraordinary to me, like EFA and EMI and all the new ones, uh, we should look more and more at this type of hard end. I think probably the root of what we want to consider is the follow-up of what we've had as building blocks of prior studies to think about now we're in, er in an era of probably looking at comparative effectiveness. And I think having large enough comparative effectiveness studies that we could also have subpopulations to say, okay, in patients that are really active, as Amy's suggesting, clearly we need peaks that are much more close to normal to prevent you from having joint bleeds or damage. Maybe for someone who's less active, that's not as much of an issue. So I think it really probably is anchored on some comparative effectiveness trials moving forward that really look at, again, not just, I think the new assumption is that median ABR will be zero <laughs> or close to there, but then having a better sense of what the joint the joint outcomes are longitudinally, both in terms of how it looks likely with some radiographic study, ultrasound, MRI, and how patients report their joints feel through their daily lives. I look back to as an important publication from 2020 was the follow-up from the joint outcome study that was done in the U.S. So again, joint outcome was 2007 publication, which really looked at 
Profi versus on demand. We knew Profi was the path forward. But then Dr. Manko Johnson and I think Beth Warren's the first author of that study, they looked at then how do those patients do up through 18? And they still followed not all of them, but some of the patients in a rigorous fashion. And what they found was, yep, early initiation of prophylaxis, you do better when you're leaving adolescence and entering adulthood, but still the patients that had early initiation of prophylaxis had joint damage. And so that lets us know what we walked away with 2007 standard of care is not good enough to protect our patients' joints long-term. So now with our modern products, how do we really make sure that we're doing what we think we're doing, which is protecting joint health and other bleeds, of course. That's good. And I would agree with you. Johnny, one of the things that I, I was struck by what you said earlier was that how much easier emicizumab was to get maybe than the traditional factor therapy. How is that affecting your practice in South Africa? Is it? This discussion is quite uh, enlightening and perhaps to emphasize the points that were made earlier on, uh, that it, it's not a binary uh, choice, either this or the other one. And perhaps one could bring into the picture as to exactly what are the choices. We, we live in an extremely exciting era where, in my view, we have two evolutions. The, the one is the evolution of the therapeutic tools. And these tools, in fact, fall into that basket. Uh, and, and you could argue as a consequence of that or independently, there is also an evolution of the goals of therapy in hemophilia. And, and what we really need to be focusing on uh, is how at the end are we making these to talk to each other, the evolving goals and the evolving therapeutic landscape. And in our environment, the view we normally take is it's just back to basics. Is I think what Lynn referred to is I think we've got an opportunity here to individualize therapy. Um, and, and we go back to asking patients, if you had an option of a therapy that works, what would you want to do with your life? And the answer to that question will then start to make us choose the right therapeutic for that individual. Of course, within the constraints of our health system, etc. But that's the way we tend to approach these things. And in fact, uh, with that approach, we, we are also able to beginning to address, I think, what continuously keep on challenging us. Uh, I, I think what I was referring to earlier on is, do, do you aim for a particular trough or do you aim for a particular activity associated with a particular trough? And in fact, it's all of those. It's not one or the other. And, and, and at individual patient level, perhaps uh, to come back to the question you ask, what data are we still missing? What data we're missing is the data at individual level. We do have aggregate data. We, we've seen it all. Median, mean of ABR of zero, acceptable safety profile, and a whole host of things. But what we should be starting to accumulate is at individual patient level, when you've got the right patient with the right goals, how do we choose the right treatment for that patient? And, that, and that's how we look at it. Uh, in, in our environment. With more treatment options come more opportunity for individualized precision medicine. More data, more research into meaningful endpoints beyond just annual bleed rate, and more holistic tracking of joint health over time are just a few of the highlights from our discussion, which thus far has consisted of novel therapies that have been made commercially available in the past few years. But what about the evolving story of investigational therapies targeting the tissue factor pathway inhibitor or antithrombin generation or other memetics currently in the clinical trial pipeline? What is notable amongst this group of investigational therapies? I can start with concizumab, which is a daily sub Q injection. Now, the nice thing, it, it, it is daily. That sounds like more of a burden of treatment, but it's a very small needle. It's a pen, it's very easy to administer, and it's pretty easy to remember that you take your medication once a day. Johnny can talk about Marstezumab, which has a different dosing regimen, which is more like Emmy's dosing regimen. It has flat-based dosing, whereas Concizumab uh, is dosed actually per kilo. Um, these agents work through a different 
pathway in coagulation by inhibiting tissue factor pathway inhibitor and releasing the inhibition and generating more 10A to allow hemostasis to go forward in patients with either factor eight, factor nine deficiency or inhibitors. As a quick reminder, factor eight and factor nine's primary role in hemostasis is to activate factor 10. So in theory, an agent that could generate more activated factor 10 by targeting another pathway could work around an absence of factor eight or factor nine and keep the rest of the coagulation cascade functioning as expected. Now, my personal experience with this agent has been in factor nine deficient patients with inhibitors. I have one small person, he was small when he entered the trial, who's been on the trial bled quite frequently, a nine with an inhibitor, used a lot of recombinant factor 7A to either treat a bleed once it occurred or to try to suppress bleeds from occurring because he was bleeding so frequently. And the use of this agent has really transformed his life in terms of his rate of bleeding, um, the family's comfort, his ability to be active. it's really been a game changer for him. So if you asked this family, is a daily injection worth it for them compared to how they were living before, they'd say absolutely yes, okay? You can look at the data from the concizumab trials when you look at factor eight deficiency, and most of them were patients who were on demand before and then switched to say concizumab or factor nine and switch to concizumab. It does lower the ABR. I think the issue is really, again, individualizing therapy. What's best for the patient? Now, Donna, you and I know when we trained in the same place, we were always told, replace what's missing in the patient to allow the body to resume its normal mechanisms for hemostasis and for healing. Now, for factor eight and nine deficiency, we actually can do that with other agents. With factor eight with inhibitors, we have emicizumab, which has shown remarkable therapeutic uh, gains for those patients. Um, And now I think these TFPI inhibitors can be game changers for factor nine patients with inhibitors. Um, It can also add for other treatment options for some patients Uh, who may have difficulty with some of the other agents that are available for treating their disease. But really, I look at this as a game changer for factor nine with inhibitors because it's the first real prophylactic therapy that can help prevent or control bleeding. Concizumab has been approved for use in Canada, Japan, and elsewhere, but not yet by the FDA in the United States or by the EMA in Europe, two of the major regulatory authorities worldwide. Why? I'm not on that end of uh, the work with those agencies. I, I know that, yes, there were safety issues and those related to treatment of patients on top of concizumab for the most part and patients who had specific issues. So there was a pause in the study and they did a risk mitigation analysis And what they found is, interestingly, that you need to control the use of other exogenous agents if a patient has a bleed. So you can't just treat at whatever dose with whatever agent you want. Now we're starting with a specific dose and then testing the level at one month. And if it's below a certain level, we go up on the dose. And if it's above, we go down. And then we continue that dose, and then we're using tighter controls on exogenous hemostatic agents. And post that, there have not been safety concerns. I agree with uh, Amy completely. Uh, maybe I could add one or two things uh, with regard to uh, concizumab, and then perhaps uh, share our experience with uh, mestacimab. 
Uh, the, the reason for the daily injections, the drug undergoes target-mediated drug disposition. And the consequence of that, of course, is that one is not able to maintain a high enough hemostatic level for the drug to be protective. And, and that is the main uh, biological reason for the daily injections. And the question, I think, what Amy alluded to earlier on, is this burdensome to the patients? In my experience, in fact, uh, theoretically, yes, but once patients start to get into the mode of daily injections, suddenly, in fact, they prefer that rather than having to inject themselves once a week, uh, once every two weeks. And I don't have data to back this up. I think that, in fact, the compliance with a daily injection may well be uh, working much better than a variable interval during which the patients are injecting. And then perhaps the other comment I wanted to make is the unique feature of this particular drug is the dosing regimen. Uh, and, and, and it's something that we're not used to in the context of hemophilia. So, so if one looks at the uh, range, uh, applying the same dose of weights is, is quite wide. Um, and, and one could then argue that uh, there may well be uh, some therapeutic risk associated with that. So, so as Amy has indicated, once the mitigating measures were put in place, in other words, once the dose has been adjusted and other measures were put in place, we have not seen any of those potential serious adverse events associated with uh, the use of the drug, consuzumab. Mestazumab, we've used this in the phase one, phase two, and now, in fact, we're completing the phase three study. It has exactly the same mechanism of action, sorry, site of action as the consuzumab. It binds to the K2 domain of the tissue factor pathway inhibitor. Uh, it is given uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, and in fact, the dosing is a little bit slightly different because it does not undergo the target-mediated drug disposition. Uh, the dose can be adjusted depending, of course, at the, dis the discretion of the treater. Starting dose is about 150 milligrams given subcutaneously, and then one can up that if there is breakthrough bleeds. And the good news, of course, uh, with mestacemab is that to date in the data that is publicly available, we have not seen any thrombosis at all. Uh, and in fact, this is now throughout the program, whether one is looking at phase one, phase two, and more recently, the, the phase three data. Um, so, so it is exciting time to see these uh, anti-TFPIs probably uh, nearing the end of their clinical development and, and, and soon to become available uh, with a slightly different way of being given, but having almost the same outcome. Certainly more to come on both concizumab and mustacemab as investigational treatment options for patients with hemophilia A or B with or without inhibitors. The last novel therapy we'll discuss in some depth today is fetusaran, a small interfering RNA therapeutic for subcutaneous prophylaxis in individuals with hemophilia A or B. Fetusaran seeks to bring about hemostasis not by replacing or mimicking a factor protein, but rather by directly impacting a person's ability to generate thrombin. This steady state hemostasis is what we're striving for with Fetuzaran. To achieve that, it isn't a protein replacement, but it is enhancing thrombin generation potential. And uh, in order to do that by knocking down antithrombin, you have to knock down antithrombin to quite low levels. And to really even approach normal thrombin generation, you really have to get your antithrombin levels down to the less than 15% uh, range. Now, that can be done safely in the context of a patient who has a drastically impaired thrombin generation in the context of severe hemophilia. But the most potent modulation of impaired thrombin generation is to replace the missing factor. If you give factor eight or factor nine in both settings, you immediately start to normalize that thrombin generation potential. So where the hazards are with antithrombin knockdown is in the context of when you have to give replacement therapy. And even though that was anticipated in the clinical trial, there were some uh, settings where patients use more uh, factor than uh, was recommended. This was associated with thrombotic episodes. And this was particularly true in the patients who had the very lowest degrees of knockdown of antithrombin. 
And risk mitigation was put in now in two fashions. First, bleed management guidance has been provided so that all the clinicians and the patients understand you have to use dramatically reduced doses of replacement to achieve the same clinical outcome, which is to treat a bleed or to manage a patient for surgery. So that's the first thing. But the second thing was just reported in, in the past year, and this was, is it safe to have everybody knocked down to antithrombin levels that are that low? And should we take the foot off the accelerator uh, analogy a little bit and uh, give a little bit less knockdown in order to reduce the proportion of patients who have these very uh, marked uh, knockdowns of antithrombin? And so they came up with an antithrombin targeted approach where they're aiming for antithrombin knockdown between 15 to 35 percent. And there was some question in many people's minds, including the investigators, would this achieve a satisfactory efficacy as well as improve the overall safety profile? And the data that was just reported ISTH, I think, does answer that question. If we look at some of the safety features, thrombotic risk was taken down to a baseline that has been observed in patients who are not on this therapeutic platform. It wasn't zero, but it's back to baselines that are more typical for patients who are on other hemophilia therapeutics. There was an issue, this does target the liver for any thrombin knockdown. There was elevations of uh, transaminases, and those observations, again, went back to levels that are more typical for patients who are on other therapeutic products. And then finally, what was the efficacy? Did we lose anything? Well, if we look at the historical ABR for patients who were on-demand treatment, their historical ABRs were 20 on the original dosing regimen, which was the fixed dosing, we saw an ABR of about 0.7. And then on the AT-guided dosing, dosing, the observed ABR was 0.87. So it seemed that by taking the foot off the accelerator a little bit, we were able to maintain a good efficacy and improve the overall safety profiles. The, the heme B and the heme B inhibitor population have not been able to enjoy the benefits of a non-factor therapy as our heme A patients for. So, so right off the bat, that's an unmet need. And I think it has proven efficacy in that population. So I think this has a path forward, finally, you could say, because this has been a decade of uh, development of this product. And they're well underway for undergoing a review with the regulatory agencies. And I think we can anticipate hearing about this in the new year, about whether this gets approved. I think there's several advantages of this product compared to some other uh, therapeutic interventions. And again, this becomes another tool in the toolbox. What we don't want to miss with this whole story with Fetuzaran, with the modified AT dosing-based regimen, the vast majority of patients are only going to need six subcutaneous doses per year. So every two months. We just haven't had any sort of therapeutic that looks anything like that. Just to comment on what Steve said about Fetuzaran, one of the things you have to think about is with six injections a year, that's amazing. But if you have a problem, the half-life is long. And so you may have to think about replacing antithrombin in those patients. And what's nice about concizumab and perhaps mirstazumab is the shorter half-life, more so with concizumab than with mirstazumab for if you're going to get into a problem huge car accident, major orthopedic surgery, you might have a little more wiggle room with some agents compared to others. Fetusaran, concizumab, mastazumab, emicizumab, and of course, FNS octagog alpha. These five novel hemophilia therapies each have their unique characteristics and considerations, and I appreciate the expertise of our panel in helping me better understand the current state of research into each. As we begin to wrap up, what are each of our panelists anticipating coming down the pike? What are you most excited about with respect to ongoing long-term drug development in hemophilia? I'm excited about a lot of things that are coming down the pike. One is a longer lasting factor 7A, Another is optimization of these memetics, two of which are in fairly advanced clinical studies. Oral agents, amazing. 
just amazing using nanobodies and heavy chains from camelids. My gosh, it's frightening. <laughs> But I think what we're missing is some of the rare disorders. And that's been a large concern of mine for some of our other patients, that they are being left behind a lot of the innovation. And what about von Willebrand disease? Oh, there's exciting things with von Willebrand disease coming up with unique antibodies that prolong its half-life that can be utilized. There's a, a lot that's coming down the pike. I think what I'm saying is really related to a hope that I have and that I think we all share, which is thanks to the richness of these armamentarium that nowadays we have and we will have in the future. I do hope that as, ma as many patients possible around the world can get profit. So prophylaxis for all should not be just like a statement, should be reality. And I do see in the potential for that in the fact that we have all these new molecules. And briefly, if you have a molecule that can cover MA, MB, with and without inhibitors, and maybe some other disease, in countries where access is not that easy, maybe also going for one molecule for many patients could be a way Maybe not ideal because you cannot individualize as much as possible, but still you can offer prophylaxis to many. And the first one for me is von Willebrand disease. We should not wait decades as we did for hemophilia. We should learn from experience. We need to go for profi now to those patients, not because they are bleeding, but because we, are, we want to give them a normal life. And I'm, I'm going to try not to repeat what uh, uh, Amy and Maria so elegantly uh, put forth. Perhaps uh, the, the most exciting thing for me is the, the diversity of the therapeutic options that we have, which uh, at least in theory, and I think in, to some extent in practice, are agnostic to the phenotype. So the concept that we are now targeting impaired thrombin generation as opposed to just treating hemophilia A or hemophilia B with or without inhibit, that to me is very exciting. And of course, it alludes to the concept that both Amy and, and Maria Elisa alluded to, that once we've got proof of concept in the diseases that we're familiar with, we may extend those to rare diseases that currently have no treatment options at all. The, the second thing that really excites me, uh, and I live in that part of the world where access has been uh, yeah, a problem, um, with the evolving therapeutic landscape, we, we are beginning to see people almost jumping from no treatment to prophylaxis. Um, an example, of course, of uh, the technology that we went through, where, when people embrace the cell phone technology without ever seeing the land lie. And I think, in fact, we may well be reproducing uh, that phenomenon uh, with the current therapies that are evolved. And of course, all of us are looking forward to the day when uh, the, the, the genetic aspect of the disease can be cured. So I think what I am most excited about, and some of this probably gets back to my wiring as a clinical trialist, is how we can take some of the therapies that have been improved in likely hemophilia and think about their applicability in other pockets of populations or patients that have been excluded from the prior pivotal trials. And I think things to focus on for me are women and girls with bleeding disorders and something that I see week in and week out. I'm wearing my white coat because I'm on service, getting calls about about women whose periods are so heavy, we're needing to get them back in for IV iron and think about next wave of what we could offer for menstrual control. I think that's where the daily dosing, quick on, quick off, maybe that's a great option for a patient who needs augmented hemostasis only during their cycles, but not other times. Or maybe it's a therapy that requires not frequent dosing and it could be sub-Q. So I think that's where we are going to want to reconvene as a group of thought leaders to think about how do we target those unmet areas of our clinical care 
with the therapies that we would have. And I think going a little bit back to trial design, we have to recognize we've not done a good job including women and girls. We've not necessarily included minority populations that reflect the patients that we see in our own practices and to really make a commitment to studying that for the future. Well, I think there's still some additional stories to be told with the non-factor therapies. And there's some programs that have some different targets, and I think they potentially have some differentiating aspects. And what we've seen with targeting TFPI and antithrombin is a global modulation of the thrombin potential in patients. And there is some positives to that, but there's also some risk in that. And one of the things that I think I'm following is targeting activated protein C. This We know this has been a, a major regulator of hemostatic potential. It's the primary regulator of the function of factor VIII. And these programs that are targeting either using a bioengineered serpent, serpent PC program, or now a new monoclonal antibody, I think these are differentiating in that they don't change the overall thrombin potential in the patient's plasma, but they alter it in a dynamic fashion when coagulation gets activated. And I think what I'm looking to see from the clinical trial program is, does this have the kind of efficacy we're looking for without carrying some of the thrombotic risk that we've seen with the other programs? I, I want to see what we end up with as the trials come to fruition. Thank you for bringing that up. I obviously didn't have enough time to include those, and I was hoping somebody would mention it. And as well as I understand now some targeting of protein S, yes, there's a lot of excitement going on in that whole realm of generating thrombin. There is a lot of excitement in numerous pockets of the novel therapies for hemophilia landscape, and there are clearly still many questions. For example, with all of these therapeutic options, what is stopping us from making prophylaxis for all a reality worldwide? How can women, girls, and marginalized populations be better accounted for in follow-up or long-term data collection to mitigate clinical trials that did not adequately account for their participation at the onset? And how can clinical trial design do better in the future? And how much should a patient's stated goal, such as to play high-level competitive basketball, impact the treatment decision that he or she makes in consultation with their provider? Our expert panel shared many thoughtful insights about the novel therapy landscape, and as they have each contributed meaningfully to that landscape as researchers, I thank them for their dedication to advancing hemophilia care. I also want to thank them for joining Dr. Donna D. McKelly and I on the Global Hemophilia Report. Doctors Lynn Malik, Maria Alicia Mancuso, Johnny Malangu, Amy Shapiro, and Steve Pipe. Thank you for that rich and illuminating conversation on the novel therapy landscape. Thank you as well to Global Hemophilia Report Senior Advisor and Interviewer, Dr. Donna D. McKelly. Thank you to Keith Corneluk and the production and distribution team. And thank you, Sanofi for supporting these outstanding discussions here on the Global Hemophilia Report. If you enjoyed this discussion, please share the Global Hemophilia Report with colleagues, friends, or anyone you think could benefit from its content. You can find links to all prior episodes by visiting globalhemophiliareport.com or by searching for Global Hemophilia Report wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be back next month with another outstanding conversation about the research and data driving hemophilia care and study. My name is Patrick James Lynch, and until then. At Santa Fe, we're here to help in ways big and small. You inspire us to push our research further, break new ground in treatment, and help to redefine hemophilia for this incredible community. Discover what Santa Fe's dedication can mean for you at redefininghemophilia.com.